Hey folks, right now what I want to do is give you a little introduction to Gauss's Law. You hopefully you've already read the chapter and you kind of went, what? All right, so this is kind of like just a review of what you should have got out of that chapter and it's really necessary to do that. And especially calculus-based physics, you really got to do some really good understanding. The calculus isn't that complicated, but knowing what to do is sometimes very, very complicated. So I'm going to share that with you and then make a supplementary video where we'll do some sample problems that will really help you out. Okay? So here's the concept. If you have a charge and you want to know the electric field right about here, okay? what's the E field right at that point P? So what's the E field at point P? And the answer is, if it's a positive charge, the E field is that. That's the vector that represents the electric field at that point. And Coulomb's law was awesome. You learned that the force equals K, Q, Q. So this is the first charge, that's that dude. And then here's the little charge you put out there. And then divide it by the R squared. And K was equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So it's Q1, Q2, all divided by R squared. You learned all the inverse square law when you got to that chapter. And that's the force of attraction or repulsion between a charge here and a charge there and with a distance r between the two. Okay? So then the next chapter talked about fields, and you were talking about this concept of an electric field. So what is an electric field? An electric field is a place in space where a charge feels an electric force. What's a gravity field? A place in space where a mass feels a gravity force. Weight. I weigh something in this room because of a gravity field in the room. How strong is the field? The gravity field in this room is the force of gravity, known as how much I weigh, divided by how much mass I got. So in the olden days, you thought it was the acceleration due to gravity. But now I'm telling you that the gravity field strength is 9.81 newtons for every kilogram of mass. See, it's a different way of thinking of the field known as gravity. Same thing with the electric field, same equation practically. It's the electric force divided by the charge that feels the force. How do you know if you have a gravity field in the room? Masses feel forces. How do you know you have an electric field in the room? Charges feel forces. All right? So the electric field is the force ratio to the charge. The charge that feels the force, electric field. So if you put that into the Coulomb's Law equation for point charges only, for point charges, the thing I'm about to say is only for a point charge a distance away, then that equals this without one of the Q's. One of the Q's just cancel. In other words, the little baby test charge or proton there, just take it away and ask me, hey, what's the electric field at that point? There's nothing there. But at that point, what is the strength of the field? If I did put a charge there, it would feel a force. But if I don't put a charge there, it's still got a field. If there's nobody in this room, gravity field's still here. But the minute you walk in the room, you go, oh, I weigh something. Why? Because you have mass in a gravity field. Get it? So the gravity field in the room is going to be 9.81 newtons per kilogram, whether we are in the room or not. It's a field. That's the concept that humans invented to, to come up with another way of thinking of this stuff. So this is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times q over r squared. So it's just the charge that's actually creating the field, and the electric field is kq over r squared. One of, the, one of the q's went away. Okay? So that's what you got from the previous chapter, hopefully. All right? So Coulomb's law was you just found out how far away you were. That would be the electric field. But that only worked for point charges. There's some things that aren't point charges. All right, so then you learn, hopefully, if you read the book, that if you had like a Van de Graaff generator, and that Van de Graaff generator was charged positively, the Van de Graaff generator is a hollow metal shell. Did you hear the word metal? Metal is a conductor. So it's all hollow with this skin of metal around it. So if you're out here at point P, and I said, hey, what's the electric field? that far away from this charge, and it's charged to uh, 100 microcoulombs, and I'm one meter away from it. One meter away from what? From the center. Oh, this is going to sound familiar. If you remember previous chapters and previous semesters, 
where all the mass acted like it was at the center. Remember all that torque stuff we learned last semester? Well, now all the charge acts like it's at the center if you're way out here. If you're way out here, you can pretend that's a point charge in the center, and you can use Coulomb's law. K, Q, over R squared. Easy. So I even know what the answer is here. E equals uh, K, which is about 9 billion. All right, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 is really close to 9 billion newtons uh, meters squared per coulomb squared, weird units, okay? It's just so that everything cancels and you end up with um, uh, newtons when you're done if you do it that way, okay? So uh, K times Q, 100 microcoulombs is 1 times 10 to the minus 4, I think, all divided by 1 meter squared. So 9 times 1 is 9, 9 minus 4 is 5, so E for this thing is da, 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 uh, 9 with 5 zeros after it. So 9 hundred-thousand newtons per coulomb. That's the units, newtons per coulomb. They didn't name it in any special. So that's the electric field that far away. So you learned this from previous chapters, hopefully, so everything's like, okay, I get it, I get it. All right, you can use Coulomb's law to find the electric field at that point, okay? But if somebody asked you what it was on the inside, you can't pretend all the charges in the center. The charge isn't at the center, the charge is over on the, on the rim. You can't do that. So on the inside, what's the electric field? Well, if you write your chapter, you're going to find out the punchline. The punchline is there is no electric field on the inside. Isn't that cool? It's like a dead zone in there. All the charges are all kind of like pointing in different directions. And when you sum up the billions of little arrows, you get zero anywhere on the inside. All right? Ask your parents tonight, hey, mom, dad, how come when you're in a car and a high voltage wire hits you or a lightning bolt hits your car, how come you're okay? Nine out of ten people say rubber tires. And you gotta think, now wait a minute. Electricity got through a hundred feet of air without a problem at all. You think rubber tires are gonna save you? You know, right? air is the best insulator there is, and it got through air without a problem. Rubber tires ain't gonna stop, you know, a lightning bolt. So why are you safe inside of a car? Because you're inside of a metal ball. You can put your hand right on the side of this ball. There could be sparks like crazy flying on the outside. But if you were on the inside of the ball, you could put your hand right against the metal. Nothing. There's no electric field on the inside. You gotta, you know, do some calculus to prove it. But Gauss's law does it in like one step. And that's what we want to talk about today. So Gauss's law is this really weird shortcut that you sometimes can take. You can't always take it, but sometimes you can take it. Let me show you when you can't do it, okay? If I have a positive charge right here, and a positive charge right here, and I want to know the E field right here at point P, you can't do Gauss's law, <laughs> all right? Because there is an electric field because of this guy. Here's E1, and then there's an electric field because of this guy. And that's E2. And you have to go absolutely crazy. I think I'm going to make a separate video to do a couple of these just so you feel a little confident about that. But hopefully you remember enough from previous semesters where you realize there is a component of E2 uh, cosine theta, where this is theta. Theta. Okay? And then there's a component of E1 in the same direction, E1 cosine theta. Now, if these two charges are equal, that's sweet, and it's just two times the, right? Because they just add, they're in the same direction. But the Y component, E2 sine theta, and over here, E1 sine theta, can you see that the vertical components will cancel? So you got some symmetry going on here? So you can calculate the net electric field at that point, and the answer is horizontal. Get it? Even though this one's up and to the right, this one's up to the left, and the Y component's canceled, 
the answer to poets ask. So there's a lot of stuff in that chapter that you got to do. I'm sure there'll be a test question very similar to this. So be prepared for that. Okay? But today I want to show you that you can't use Gauss's law for this thing because the electric field is different at different points. You're looking for something that has symmetry. You're looking for a point where you could kind of find a shape that you can imagine around the charge distribution that will give you the same electric field everywhere around the charge distribution. I'll give you an example. If you have a, uh, a rod like this, and you have a rod, and let's say it goes on forever, <laughs> like it's infinitely long rod. Okay, it won't work if it's finite. But if it's infinitely long, let's say it had a, a, a constant charge distribution. Okay? So, um, uh, depending on what book you're using, you might have a linear charge distribution, and it's charge per length. You might use another Greek letter, like eta, 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 and that might be charge per area, right? And then rho would be charge over volume. So that would be like the charge density in three dimensions, the charge density in two dimensions, the charge density in one dimension. I've seen some books use lambda, and I hate them. I hate them all because lambda is the one we've been using for wavelength the whole lives. I hate that. So I use mu, uh, charge per length, all right? Charge per area if it's a plate, okay? And charge over volume if it's a sphere. Get it? Sphere, plate, wire. That's what you use for these three things, okay? So with a little bit of calculus, you can see that if you wanted to know dq, this little infinitesimal piece of charge, then you would just multiply the, the linear density, charge density, times dl. And now you could integrate for a length, because this hopefully is constant if it's a uniform density. If it's not a uniform density, I'll give you the function to put in there so you can still find dq. So every time you see a dq, you can replace it with density times dl or dA. So this one would be uh, dq over here would be um, uh, eta times dA. And over here, this will show up a lot in uh, Gauss's law, uh, dq, when you integrate dq, you could integrate instead rho dV. And everybody knows that the derivative of dV is area. So what's the surface area of a sphere? If this was a three-dimensional object like a sphere, you might get something like 4 pi r squared dr to replace dv with. And then rho might be a constant. If it is, it comes out. And then what's the integral of dv? What's the integral of this? It's 4 pi r cubed over 3, or 4 thirds pi r cubed, which is volume. So if you integrate dv, you get v. All right? But if you have rho not constant, it stays in, and then you mess it and, and manipulate that. Okay? I'm getting ahead of myself. I do want to point out to you that <clears throat> what's the electric field right here at point P? Well, it's the same electric field magnitude-wise as here. This point has the ele same electric field. So does this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, and this point right here in space. Get it? So. You can make an imaginary shape to go around here. It's called a Gaussian surface. So you can make like a, a cylinder. And my drawing just sucks. Okay? But you can make a cylinder that goes around this thing. And every point on the surface of this cylinder, all the way around here like this, has the same electric field. So when you read the book, look for places where there's a lot of symmetry. And the electric field is the same on an imaginary surface. Best example I can give you would be a sphere. So if you start with a point charge, okay, then I could do an imaginary Gaussian surface. And you've got to imagine this is 3D. You see a sphere? Use your imagination. This is a big sphere around here. The electric field here is the same as the electric field here. And the same as the electric field here. 
Now keep in mind, I invented this surface. But I invented the surface so no matter where I am on the surface, the magnitude of the electric field is the exact same. Okay? I wanted to introduce you to another little concept. Every spot on the surface, I mean, if this is, you know, a surface, every spot on the surface has a little bit of an area. And this area has the electric field coming out of that area, and this surface has a vector known as dA. So this surface has a vector at a right angle to the surface called dA. It's an infinitesimally small amount of the surface. So the little piece of the surface is dA, a, di a differential piece of the whole area. If you integrated dA over the whole closed surface, you would get A, right? If you summed up all these little chunks on the surface, you would get the entire surface area of the sphere which I think is 4 pi r squared, okay? So where am I going with this thing? Well, how much flux or how much lines of electric field are coming out of this thing, all right? You want it so that there is a right angle between the surface and the electric field. Why? Because this little vector called dA if E is in the same direction, and you learn dot products from previous periods, E dot dA, I do not want to deal with an angle. So Gauss's law is what you use when this becomes a joke integral. Because if E is constant, it comes out of the integral. And if dA is actually in the same direction as E, then the dot product is cosine of zero. I don't know if you remember dot product, but it was E A cosine theta. All right? And so cosine of zero, cosine of 180, those are the ones you want. Because the cosine of zero is one, and the cosine of 180 is negative one. So I've got a really kind of an interesting concept to show you what I'm really talking about. You totally lost me what I just said. You read the book and you still didn't get it, and you just watched me do this, and still didn't get it. Maybe this will help. Think of this box as the dA. So I want you to imagine a vector dA coming out of the surface area. Here's the surface area of the box. Here's dA. You see it? It's a vector that represents an arrow that's perpendicular to this little section of the area of the sphere or the area of whatever this Gaussian surface is. A little chunk of the total area is dA, a differential piece, infinitesimally small piece. Do you see the vector? Use your imagination. There's a vector coming out of this box, and we're going to label that vector dA. It's an arrow that represents a perpendicular normal arrow, normal perpendicular to the surface that we're talking about. So, I want you to imagine the light from this projector as flux. Rays of light are like the electric field. Are you with me? So the electric field is the rays of light. Now, what is the flux through this thing? Look, if dA is in the same direction as E, look at what it does on the projector. Maximum Area. If this was water, it would fill up the bucket the quickest. I mean, it, the water would fill up. If this was like rainwater coming in, and I had the bucket aimed like this, I'd have the maximum flux. Maximum number of field lines coming through. Flux are field lines. Field lines are flux. But watch what happens. What if I turn this thing so it's like 30 degrees? Okay? Then I'm only getting 86%. What if I turn it so it's 60 degrees? Now I'm only getting 30%. What if this field is at a right angle to the direction dA? Here's dA. Here's the field. Look at it. I get no flux. Get it? It's like having the bucket at a right angle to the rain. No water gets in the bucket that way. So maximum when they're in the same direction. Zero 
when they're at a right angle to each other. Get it? So that's what we're dealing with with this integral. If you integrate dA, you get A. If the dot product can go away, yes. So I want a surface where the electric field is parallel to this dA, this normal vector arrow that's pointing from the surface. In other words, I get the maximum flux to that little dA. All right? When you can get that to happen, that's when you use Gauss's law. Other other times, you just have to do superposition, which means add a bunch of vectors together, and oh my goodness, if you have five charges up here, and you want to know the E field here, you got to find the E field from one, the E field from the other, E field from the other, and vectorally add them together. It's a horrible. But if you have a Gaussian surface around a charge, let's say you have a charge here, and a charge here, and a charge here, and you put a Gaussian surface around these guys, then the amount of flux that's coming out of here, the number of lines that are coming out of here, is because of these charges. Okay? So, if you read the book, you kind of will know where I'm going with this thing. But if I had like a cube, okay, close enough. All right, you get the idea, right? So there's a cube, and if I have field lines going in, and I have three field lines coming out, it means there's no charge in the box. Okay? So the net flux, the flux in is three, the net flux out is three, zero net flux. What that means is there's no charges inside. But if I had this surprise box and I had three arrows coming in, and five arrows coming out. The only way could that be possible is if there's a positive charge hiding in my box. In other words, these field lines are going in, but there's more coming out. You can't have more coming out unless there's a source of electric field lines from inside. So the charges on the inside would cause more lines coming out than going in. If I had a box, and I had one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven field lines going in and only five coming out. I have more going in than out. That must mean I have a negative charge in the box because there's almost like a sink. More coming out than in, we call that a source. It means positive field because a positive charge, that's where field lines come out of them. If I have more field lines going in than coming out, I must have a negative charge in the box. So here's the most profound thing about Gauss's law you can learn. The net flux is equal to the charge inside divided by a constant known as the permittivity of free space. That same epsilon zero we've been using with the other things like uh, KQQ over R squared. K stood for one over four pi epsilon zero. Epsilon was a constant in nature, called the permittivity of free space. I think it's 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 or something. Check that out, see if I'm right about that. Because 1 over that times 4 pi should give you about 9 billion. So try it and see if I'm right. Okay? So, what am I saying here? This is the simplest, most profound statement you could ever make. The net flux is equal to the charge inside the shape divided by epsilon zero. Okay? The amount of charge inside is directly proportional to the net flux. If there's more going in than out, there's a negative charge in there. If there's more coming out than in, there's a positive charge in there. If five goes in and five goes out, there's no charge on the inside. No net charge. There could be 248 charges in there, but there's no net charge on the inside. Okay? So let's put it all together with this weird thing called Gauss's Law. I could have that Van de Graaff, just like normal, with little positive charges all on the surface. And I could do a Gaussian surface out here. Now you've got to imagine that as a sphere. Okay? 
So this is a spherical ball, a beach ball, around the mandigraph. Now this, Gauss's law is only used when symmetry is high, but check this out. If this is R, this is R of the ball I just made. I made this up. The spherical thing, I made it up. That's R of the beach ball. Okay? So there's an E field right here on the beach ball surface. And there's a little DA here, a little, a little section of there. And son of a gun, DA is normal to the surface. So what's the angle between the electric field and the vector known as the normal? Zero. Yes. Zero. Cosine of zero is one. I don't have to worry about the dot product. Okay? So here comes Gauss's law. E dot dA, the sum, the integral of that, ends up being the net flux. And you know the net flux is equal to the charge inside divided by epsilon zero. So this is Gauss's law in its entirety. The net flux through the surface is equal to the charge inside divided by constant. And it's equal to E dot dA, the integral of summing up all these infinitesimally little spots here, the E field there times the little spot there. Good. Now, if we did Gauss's law right, this is a joke integral. Why? Because what's E? All on your surface. Is it different here than here? If we did it right, what's the electric field all along the surface? A constant. So it can come out of the integral. So now E is outside the integral, and I integrate dA. But the integral of dA is a joke. We made sure that dA was in the same direction as E. So the dot product doesn't matter. It's cosine of zero. And then if you integrate a billion little areas, what do you get? The total area. So this equals EA. EA of what? Your surface. What's A of your surface? 4 pi r squared. What? Yeah, the surface area of the sphere you made. So when you envelope this imaginary beach ball around the Van de Graaff generator, at any distance r away, you end up with da -da -da, charge on the inside of your sphere divided by epsilon 0 equals e times 4 pi r squared. Solve for E, and you get, hopefully, nothing surprising. You end up with 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times Q, all divided by R squared, which is the same damn thing you got in the previous thing called Coulomb's Law. You know what that means, though? Gauss's Law means you just proved that if you're outside the ball, anywhere outside the ball, it's as if all the charge is at the center of the ball. If I go out to here, at this arc, it's as if I was that far away from a point charge. I proved it. You see, Coulomb just kind of believed it. This map proves it. What if I double my distance away? One quarter of the electric field, because it's inverse square law. If I triple the distance away, the E field three times farther away is one ninth what it was right there. Is that cool? Now, what if you draw your Gaussian surface right here? What if you put the beach ball on the inside of the Van de Graaff one millimeter away from the edge? What's the electric field on the surface of your beach ball? And the answer is E equals dA, that side. But what's the charge? inside my red beach ball. Zero. There is no charge on the inside of the beach ball. It was all on the surface because it was a conducting shell. So what's the electric field on the inside? Guess what I just proved? There is a zero electric field on the inside of the van Now And that's why you're alive in your car when the lightning hits you. Not the rubber tires. You're in a metal ball. And according to Gauss's law, if there's no charge on the inside, 
there's no electric field on the inside, and therefore all the forces must cancel out. Yeah, this is profound. It works. You almost have to go, does that really work? There's no electric field on the inside. And the answer is yes, it really works. Okay? So let's do another one. What if the ball is a non-conducting ball? What if the sphere is a non-conducting sphere? What does that mean? An insulator. And what if I put the charges on here and it's a solid ball? It's solid. Now, do you understand this thing? Solid. It's a non-conducting sphere. So we put the charges all around them. On the inside, outside, everywhere. And let's make the charge density constant. Oh, that would be nice. Charge density is constant. Okay? All right. So this ball is floating in space with uniform charge density. And I'm over here. And I'm like, hey, what's the E field right here at this point P? And so what do you do? Make a Gaussian surface over here where you're asking about. Big sphere. What's special about the surface of that sphere? The electric field is constant. <laughs> and what about the, di the direction between DA and E? They're in the same direction, outward. It's positively charged sphere. The arrow's that way. If it was negative, the arrow would be the opposite way. You just have 180. You'd have a negative answer. Great. Of course you have a negative answer because it's going, the electric field's the opposite. Okay? Either way, the electric field is constant on that thing. So if you integrate E dot DA, you just get a joke integral and you get EA, which is E times 4 pi r squared where r is the distance from the center to where you are. And that equals charge enclosed divided by epsilon zero. And what do you get? The same damn thing you got last time. The electric field is equal to kq over r squared, 1 over 4 pi epsilon zero times q. In other words, if it's solid or hollow, if you're out here, you have no idea. It acts as if all of the charges at the center. Again, proving it. Do you know Isaac Newton did this for gravity? Because the Earth is a uniform mass distribution. And he said, if you're outside the Earth, it acts like all the mass of the Earth is at the center. And he couldn't prove it with the math that existed, so he sat under a tree and invented integral calculus just so that he could prove that all the mass of the Earth was acting like it was at the center. So he's doing Gauss's law for mass distribution. I'm doing it for charge distribution. Okay? All right, here comes the good part now. All right? What if, what does this turn into if you're at the surface? What if you change your Gaussian surface so your Gaussian surface is the radius of the ball? What if this ball has radius, I don't know, uh, A, little letter A? What if the radius of this ball is letter A? And you want to do the Gaussian surface right on the skin. Okay? So now E field is this way, and DA is this way, and it's the same damn thing. And you work it out. Pause the video if you need to. Work it out. But the electric field at the surface is equal to KQ all divided by A squared. Because R is A now. No problem. Isn't that cool? Right, now comes the fun. Now comes the fun. What happens on the inside? What if you draw a Gaussian surface here, a radius R? Your Gaussian surface is a radius R. A little beach ball on the inside. Imagine a little beach ball taking up space on the inside of this solid charge distribution. You can think of it as a cloud of charge if you want. If you're having trouble imagining a beach ball in there, put a beach ball inside of a cloud of charge. A spherical cloud of charge and you put a beach ball in there. What is the electric field here? Now think about it. This is what made Newton one of the geniuses of geniuses. He did this with gravity and it, it made what he realized profound inside. Inside was cool. Outside, it's as if all the mass is at the center. But what happens if it's inside? Oh, wait a minute now. I've got charges here that are pushing that way. 
and I got charges here that are pushing that way. The E field on the inside can't be as big as the surface. It can't get bigger than that. It's got to be less than that when you're farther away, because you're farther away. But what about on the inside? Well, I'll give you a hint. What's the electric field at the very, very center? And the answer is zero. The electric field at the very center is zero. Because it's all charges are all canceling. All the vectors would cancel on the very, very center. So what's the electric field here at my Gaussian surface on the inside? All right? Now, don't lose me on this, because this is the only time where you actually have to do a little bit of calculus. Okay? Because, I don't know if you noticed, but we were doing E dot dA, and we weren't doing calculus. And then we did charge inside divided by epsilon zero, and we never had to do calculus because the charge inside was all the charge. But now the charge inside is not all the charge. There's some charge outside of your Gaussian surface. Okay? This is the part of this video that you might have to play this about five times, all right? What came before you probably could handle me talking really fast, but right now, this is where you really got to watch this carefully. There's charges on the outside of your sphere, the red sphere. And then there's charges on the inside of your red sphere. According to Gauss's law, it's only the charge on the inside that counts. Are you with me? So this side of the integral is still a friggin' joke. It's E times the integral of dA, which is A. A of the red sphere. A of the red sphere is 4 pi r squared. Not a squared, r squared. A is the whole thing, but this is just my ball, my each ball, not the whole distribution. And that equals the charge. How do I know how much charge there is on the inside? I got to integrate. Holy cow. The integral was on this side, and I really got to integrate that side? I'll show you. Do you remember I wrote about three pages ago that dq is equal to rho times dv. Remember that? Rho is equal to dq over dv. Charge per volume. So rho was equal to the total charge over the total volume, but rho is also equal to a little bit of charge over the differential of volume, a little tiny piece of the volume. Okay? Now in calculus class, what is dv? Area. So in calculus class, if you remember what's going on in there, how do you find the volume of a sphere? Add up an onion slice, area, plus another area, plus another area, times an infinitesimally small little r, dr. Okay? So dv is equal to 4 pi r squared dr. And dr is an infinitesimally small piece of r. And you're integrating effectively a million onion peels to add up to an onion. How do you find the volume of an onion? Sum up an infinite amount of areas of the skins. That's what you learn in calc class. If you didn't learn in calc this class, you got to go back and review that. If you want to find the volume of something, you're summing up an infinitesimal, millions and millions and millions and millions of little areas of the thing. Okay? So, how am I going to rewrite this? I need the total charge on the inside. What's the total charge on the inside? It's the sum of dq over epsilon zero. I have to add up all the charges on the inside. But you can't integrate dq between 0 and r. dq is not in terms of something linear. So you have to change dq into rho dv. And you have to change that into what dv equals, which is rho dv, which is 4 pi r squared dr. Okay, let that sink in for a minute. I can't integrate dq in terms of a linear thing, like a distance. So I change dq into rho dv, and dv is area. 
So I'm sticking in area 4 pi r squared dr. Okay? And now I can integrate. And you know what the answer is. It's 4 thirds pi r cubed. You know that. Okay? And I'm integrating from 0 to r. Okay? So the punchline to the red stuff is the charge on the inside is the integral of that. So it's rho times 4 pi r squared. Okay? And if I integrate that, it's r cubed over 3. Okay? And that equals e times 4 pi r squared, the area of that thing. So you kind of see what's, what's happening. Okay? You end up with something really weird. The charge density, the 4 pi's cancel, one of the r's cancel, and you end up with rho times r, am I doing this right? Divided by 3 equals e. I do that right? 4 pi's cancel. 2 out of 3 of the r's cancel. And you end up with rho r over 3 equals e. Not weird. Okay? But what's rho? What is rho? First of all, I want you to realize rho is constant. If rho is constant, what did you just learn? The electric field is directly proportional to r on the inside. So if you graph electric field versus distance away, you would end up with inverse square law on the outside, a maximum when r equals a, zero in the middle, linear on the inside. Newton then realized that it's as if you were standing on a planet this size. Ignore the outside. You were standing on the planet right there. That would tell you how much you weighed. That would be the force of the G field. Get it? The strength of the G field right there. And the smaller, you closer you get to the middle, the smaller the planet would be until eventually you weigh nothing in the center of the Earth. That was fantastically profound to realize that it was linear on the Okay? So you learned it was in linear on the inside. You want to clean this up a little bit? What's another way of writing charge density? Charge density was also in terms of the entire charge and the entire volume. So I could rewrite this as rho, which is Q. Okay? And here's an R. Okay? And divided by 3, and it's rho divided by uh, the total volume. And what's the total volume of a sphere? 4 thirds pi. Ah, I lost epsilon zero. I knew I was missing something. There's an epsilon zero there from this little guy. So sorry. Okay? So it's this with an epsilon zero on the outside. And a 1 over epsilon zero on the outside. Totally lost the epsilon zero. I apologize. So over here there's an epsilon zero. Over here there's an epsilon zero. Okay? So this is four thirds pi a cubed. Right? Because it's the entire charge over the entire volume equals density. Density equals to the total charge over the total volume. Okay? The threes cancel. The epsilon zero should be in there. I keep forgetting that thing. And I end up with E equals Q times R. Q is the total charge times R, the radius of my where I am with respect to the center, divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 A cubed. And I end up with this as the electric field on the inside of a solid charged sphere. You tell me how far away I am from the middle, and I'll tell you what E is. R is zero, there is no E field. What if R is A? What if I build this red line out until it gets to A? Then it's A over A cubed, which is A squared on the bottom, which is 
Boone's Law again, Q, K, Q over A squared. So either we're going to come from out here and do that, or if I start from the middle and go out there, I know I'm right. It ends up being K, Q, R over A cubed, but this cancels one if this becomes A. Isn't that beautiful? All right, one more and we'll quit. Okay, what if you have a sphere and it's not uniform? What if the density changes depending on where you are? What if the density is zero in the center? And the farther out you get to the edge, the density, charge density gets greater. In other words, it's like a semiconductor, where it's zero in the middle, but the charges want to be on the outside like a conductor. If this was a conducting solid metal ball, all the charges would be on the outside. All the charges would be on the skin. There'd be zero E field in the middle because there'd be zero charge in the middle. So a hollow sphere of metal, like a Van de Graaff or a car, is the same as a solid metal ball. Charges are on the outside, inside has no E field. Because it's a conductor. And the charges all move to the outside because they hate each other. Okay? So if the charges all move to the outside. What if this was a semiconductor? What if the charge density was zero in the middle and it got more and more charged until it got to here, radius A, and it got to the end. Okay? So what if it was something like a constant beta times R? And the minute you get outside of A, zero. So this charge density is only inside here. So if R is zero, there's no charge. If R is A, most charge. Get it? Beta times R. If R is A, you get the most charge on the outside. Holy crap, how do we do Gauss's law here? Well, guess what happens on the outside? <laughs> it's the same as if it was a point charge in the middle. What if it was on the surface? It's the same as if there was a point charge in the middle. Sweet! Anytime you're on the outside, it acts as if all the charges are at the center. Does it matter if it's not uniform? Nope. But what if you're on the inside? Ah, this is the hardest Gauss's law I could give you. What if you want to know what the charge is or what the electric field is right here on the inside? Okay? Well, what if we wanted to know what the total charge was? How do you find the total charge of this sphere? Total charge of that sphere. DQ, integrated from 0 to A. But you can't integrate DQ. You, got, you can't sum up a million charges to get that. You need something linear. So what am I going to replace that with? You should be yelling out something. Right? Are you yelling it out to your TV screen? How do you replace DQ? How about replacing it with rho dV? Now, is rho constant this time? Can it come out of the integral like last time? No. But we got the function. So what do you do? Integrate from 0 to A of rho, which is beta r. And what's dv? Surface area of the sphere, the red sphere. So that's 4 pi r squared dr. Can you integrate that for me? Pause the video and integrate that and see what you get. Okay, hopefully you're back. I can bring the beta outside and the 4 pi on the outside. Okay? And then I've integrated r cubed dr. I do that right? And that gives me beta 4 pi r cubed oh, r fourth over 4 the 4 is cancelled and I am evaluating that from 0 to A and the punchline then will be beta pi A to the 4th and that folks is the total charge of the entire ball. See? You gotta integrate. 
A lot of people don't integrate it. They just think I can multiply uh, this times the volume. No. Because it's not uniform. There's more charge here than here. You've got to integrate. That's why they embedded calculus for times where you have to integrate. So anybody who multiplied rho times the volume, they think they got the answer, but it's not really Q. Q does not equal rho times the volume. You can't do that. You have to sum up all the Qs. dQ equals rho times dV. You have to sum up all the dQs to get the total Q. Okay? So that's the charge on that thing. What if I want to find the heat field out here? Uh, you know it. It's as if all the charge in the center, you know you did it right when Q is in the center. Uh, what about on the surface? Then A becomes R. What about on the inside? Well, let's do that one. Okay? If A is on, if R is on the inside, if it's the beach ball in red, then here goes charge inside my Gaussian surface divided by epsilon zero is equal to the integral of E dot dA of my Gaussian surface integrated from zero to R. Okay? And of course, that ends up being E is constant because we picked the Gaussian surface that was right. And the integral of dA on that surface, sweet, is just A, which is 4 pi r squared. The that side was easy. How about the other side? Oh, how do I sum up the Q on the inside? Boy, if it was uniform, it would just be Q of that radius. But it's not uniform. So when I integrate this thing, I've got to stick in that row thing. So this is really 1 over epsilon 0 of rho times dv, going from 0 to my r on the inside. OK? So here we go. 1 over epsilon 0 integrating from 0 to r of rho, which is beta r, and then dv is uh, the volume of my Gaussian surface. And if I integrate that, I get um, 4 thirds pi r cubed. So I didn't, I didn't I already, I already integrate integrate dv, you get v. Okay? But I can't do that because rho was not constant. So I can't do what I just did. So erase what I just did. I'm starting to lose my mind from lack of... Uh, okay? So I still have to do this thing, which is dv, which is 4 pi r squared dr. Okay? And that equals this stuff. Remember, I'm still trying to get an E field. Okay? Alright, so if I integrate that thing, I get uh, 4 pi beta over epsilon 0. And I'm integrating r cubed dr. So I end up with evaluate three r r cubed dr is r to the fourth over four. What did I do? Did I do that right? It's r cubed, so it's r four over four. And I evaluated that from zero to r, so it's just that answer. So I end up with four pi beta r to the fourth over 4, so the 4 goes away. Oh look, that's charge. <laughs> that's the charge on the inside of my ball. Do you remember the charge total? That was equal to beta pi a to the 4th. So of course this was beta pi r to the 4th because it's a smaller ball. I love when this works out like that. Okay, And that equals E times 4 pi r squared. 
okay? Before the, the pi is canceled, I lost my epsilon again. <laughs> what the heck did I do with an epsilon? It must be underneath here like that. There it is. Okay? If I bring the 4 underneath, If I bring the 4 underneath, I get a 4 here and an r squared here. And I get beta r to the second all divided by 4 epsilon 0. And that equals the electric field inside. Okay? That's the electric field on the inside of that ball. It looks weird because beta is a constant and it wasn't what you expected, but there you go. Okay? And I end up with the electric field outside, on the surface, and inside uh, in terms of the constants and the distance away. Crazy, but it did it. Okay? So that's enough to chew on. That'll help you with a whole bunch of stuff having to do with uh, Gauss's Law. And hopefully I went over enough of examples. I think if you ever have a test on something like that, it'll be something like that. I'll give you rho. I'll give you the charge distribution. If it's a wire, it's a linear charge distribution, or area on a surface, like a capacitor, things like that. If it's a sphere, it's like one of these, very similar to this, but maybe rho will be a little bit different than what you just saw. All right, go to work.